Okay, great. I'll answer more questions later, but for now, I'd like to introduce Encore. So, Encore is a grad student. He was actually an undergrad at, in the Amp Lab doing some great stuff. He liked it so much, he decided to do his PhD here as well. Uh, and he is one of the lead developers for GraphX, which is what we'll be talking about today. All right, thanks, Amit. Um, uh, hey, everyone, I'm, I'm Ankur. I'm, uh, uh, as Amit said, I'm a second year grad student in the AMP Lab. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be telling you about GraphX, uh, which is a library for graph computation on Spark. So uh, before you, 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 you hear me talk, um, it, it, might seem like, it might seem to you that graph processing is a pretty specialized topic. Um, but actually, graphs are surprisingly common. Um, and many kinds of data can actually be viewed as graphs, even if they aren't stored that way. Um, so I'm going to talk about three common examples of graphs. Um, uh, social networks, the web, and ratings graphs. All right, first of all, um, social networks are an easy example of graphs. Um, users are, are vertices, and social relationships, things like friendship and following, are edges. Um, but social networks actually aren't limited to just the, the relationship graph. Um, posts and photos can also be vertices in the same graph. And even actions, things like liking, uh, can, be, can also be part of the graph. And in fact, Facebook explicitly stores all of this kind of data uh, as one big graph in a, in a store called Tau. All right, the second example, uh, the, the web is certainly a graph. Uh, pages connect to each other using hyperlinks. And as we'll see, thinking about the web in this way was, what was a, bi a big competitive advantage for Google in its early days. And here's a, a, a neat example of analyzing the web, the web graph. Um, so the, these researchers in 2005 um, classified some political blogs by party affiliation and then visualized the, 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 the resulting graph and colored each of the vertices. And so you can see um, there's, there's a strong clustering effect where uh, political blogs apparently tend to link uh, really strongly prefer preferentially to people who share their political views. And it's rare for like a Democratic blog to link to Republicans. So that's neat. Um, and, and, and the last example of, of graphs that, that I'll give you is a less obvious one, um, where users rate, rate products on sites like Amazon or Netflix. Uh, and you can view that as a bipartite graph that has users and products as the vertices, and that has ratings between them as the edges. And uh, Amit mentioned this, so you, you're so, sort of familiar with, with it, but viewing it, viewing it as a graph is a neat trick. And we'll, we'll see how sites uh, uh, generate recommendations using ALS, as Amit was mentioning, using this graph. All right, so now that we've seen what kinds of graphs are out there, um, let's look at what you can do with them. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about three algorithms, one for each kind of graph that, uh, that you've seen. Um, so the first one is PageRank. Um, this finds the most important pages using links as a vote of importance. Um, and a vote sort of counts for more if it's, if it's coming from an important page. So for example, if the New York Times links to your blog, then since the New York Times is, is already a priori an important page, you must also have something important on your blog. So um, the, the idea of it is, is to repeatedly send votes along links and, uh, and then increase the rank of, of the pages that get them more votes, that get more votes. So, uh, so here, for example, the, the, the pages that they got two or three votes are, uh, you know, are, are bigger in, the, in that visualization. So, uh, so as I was saying, Google um, started out by, by using this to, to rank search results. And at the time, it was much more effective than the competition. And so that was uh, the, the so graphs, in a sense, were Google's big competitive advantage. All right, the second algorithm uh, is triangle counting. So what this does is it measures the cohesiveness of communities. Um, so, so here, for example, in this graph, there are three uh, social triangles that are formed. Actually, there uh, are perhaps more, but there's three you can see. So, um, and the person in the, in the center is, uh, is part of the, all three triangles, which means that his friends sort of tend to know each other. And as a result, you can see that this is sort of a strong community. Okay, the third algorithm um, is collaborative filtering. Uh, and what this does is it aims to infer what kinds of users will like what kinds of products and then make recommendations on the basis of those inferences. Um, now, um, Amit mentioned this algorithm, but he didn't tell you that you can see it as a, as a graph algorithm. So here, for example, uh, we, we can sort of, it, it'll infer that uh, the top user, for example, is interested in computers, which I have used a GAR to re represent that. Um, the middle user is interested in music, and the, the bottom user is interested in like art or photography. Uh, and, then, and then also we can infer something like the headphones in, uh, appeal to people who are, both, who are either interested in music or in art. So, um, and these sets of interests are expressed using a general concept in machine learning called features. 
Now, it turns out that, that all, all these kinds of algorithms can actually be expressed using uh, the same pattern of computation. And that pattern is the following. To calculate the value for a particular vertex, so something like a page rank, or the number of triangles passing through it, or some kind of feature, um, these algorithms only need to access the neighboring vertices and edges of that vertex. Now, they, may need, to, they may, may need to iterate this multiple times to actually get a good result, but each time, each iteration, only the neighborhood of a vertex gets accessed. And what that means is that these algorithms can be expressed as independent operations on each vertex and its neighbors. And that's what allows these algorithms to run in parallel and scale to large graphs. Now, in addition to, to those three algorithms that are, that are captured, um, this pattern of parallelism actually also captures a variety of other algorithms from uh, areas like machine learning, data, mi data mining, and graph analysis. Okay, but so far I've just talked about graphs and graph algorithms, but real graph analysis actually involves more than just running graph algorithms. Uh, for example, if you wanted to analyze Wikipedia, let's, let's walk through an example of what you'd need to do to do that. So you might start from some raw data, something like Wikipedia and XML format. Um, then you might parse it into, uh, into a, a table of the articles and their links. You could extract a link graph from that. Uh, and then you could maybe run PageRank to see how important each page is. And uh, finally, you could maybe get a list of the top 20 articles. Or you could parse it differently. You could look at who edits each article. Um, then you could make, you could, uh, so that gives you a table of edits, which is like the editor corresponding to the article they edited. And then you could, from that, make a graph of who is editing the same articles. And then you could use you could use triangle count or label propagation to do community to to, to find communities of editors, uh, and you could get a a table of um, of the, the community that each user is in. Okay. Also, we, we might uh, we might actually want to join multiple graphs together to do something like find the most influential communities on on Wikipedia. Now, notice that this process involves viewing the same data as both tables and as graphs. Okay, so now that I've given, the back, given you the background on both where graphs appear in the real world and how people usually process them, uh, we can start taking a look at how you would work with graphs using GraphX. So GraphX, first of all, um, models graphs using an idea called the property graph. So uh, what this is is that in addition to the graph structure, which you can see, um, each vertex can also have a, have a property, something like uh, the current page rank value or, um, or something more complex like a user's profile if you're on Facebook. And also, each edge can have a property, um, which, which is something like the edge weight, a, a certain type of relationship between two vertices, or the timestamp, for example, when the edge was added. Now with that, let's see how to create a graph using GraphX. Um, so what we're going to do is make a social graph, um, which, which has people in it and has relationships between them. And, uh, and now, first of all, each person in GraphX acquires a unique ID. Each vertex needs a unique ID. And so GraphX gives, it, gives us this type alias uh, for the unique ID, which, which currently has to be uh, an integer or long. So, uh, okay, the, the first step is to, is to give each vertex in, in our graph a property, which in this case will be the person's name. So here we're, we're, we're creating an RDD using uh, just Spark, um, Spark commands. And, uh, and so, so you can see that you know, person one is Alice, person two is Bob, and so on. So, uh, and then here's, here's what that graph so far looks like. It's just the vertices and their properties. Next, what we'll do is create edges, which are relationships between people in this case. Um, so GraphX gives us an edge class to do that. Uh, and, and, and it has, it has the, the source of the, of the relationship, the destination, and the property on that edge. And notice that this is a, a, a directed edge that, uh, that, that is the primitive in GraphX. So we, we can use this to create an RDD of edges. Um, so here we have uh, vertices one and two, which are Alice and Bob. They're coworkers, and, uh, and then there's also, uh, I guess, Bob and Charlie are friends, and so that's what this looks like in the graph. OK, finally, what we do is we, we, we need to wrap the whole thing into a graph using this graph constructor that GraphX gives us. So this, this packages it all together. All right, now that we have a graph, let's see what we can do with it. Um, so first of all, of course, we can, we can get back those ver vertex and edge data sets, the RDDs. So those are just table views, vertices, edges. Um, but we can also do something more interesting, which is to get an augmented version of the edges uh, called the triplets. And uh, this is the edges along with their adjacent vertex properties. And this is useful. Uh, I'll show an example of it later, but for now, I'm just going to point this out. Okay. Also, we can do some other simple transformations. So we can do things like uh, 
uh, like mapping each vertex property to a new value or mapping each edge property to a new value. Um, we can reverse all the edges in the graph. We can, uh, and, and we can also um, filter the graph using a vertex or, or an edge predicate or both. And this is also pretty useful, so I'm going to go into it in more detail later. Okay. Also, also we can we can do so, do a variety of joins, and so we can you know, sort of join external data uh, in with the graph, and this is this is useful, but I won't go into too much detail. And uh, the final thing that we can do, which is very important, is to uh, send messages along the edges. So there's this MapReduce triplets function, which which lets us do this. And uh, what, and so so again, I'll go into more detail, of course. But what this does in in a sentence is to capture that neighborhood computation pattern that I mentioned earlier, which is the key to most graph algorithms. Okay, so uh, those were some, some, primitive, some primitive operations that you can do, but GraphX also comes with some built-in algorithms that you can call on a graph. So there's PageRank, which I described, triangle count as well, and there's also uh, an algorithm called connected, connected Components, and what this does is it identifies the different pieces of the graph. So there you can see there's two, there's two pieces of the, the Twitter graph. And there, there's more than this, um, but uh, th I won't list them all. So there, there, all the other algorithms are in the graphx.lib package. All right, now I want to go into detail on, um, on three of the, the more interesting graph operations. The first one of them is triplets. So as I mentioned, uh, what this does is, is it gives you the edges along with their adjacent vertex properties. Um, and graphx packages this, this information up into uh, this data type, which is the edge triplet. So it gives you this class to, that you can use. And, um, and this has, first of all, it has the same things as an edge. So it has the source destination of uh, you know, the source vertex and destination vertex ID. And it also has an edge property. Um, but it uh, additionally has these, the corresponding vertex properties. Okay, so to, to actually see what this does, let's go back to the relationship graph that we built earlier. Um, if we take this and then call triplets on it, then we get an RDD back, which, uh, which it, it has, uh, actually it has five entries per, per row, but I've, I've uh, skipped the IDs here for space. So what, what this does is, is it tells us uh, things like the, the, ver ver the vertex with property Alice is the coworker of Bob. So there you go. Okay. Um, the second operation that I'll go into detail on is subgraph. So what this does is uh, it filters the graph according to an edge predicate, edge predicate or a vertex predicate, or both. And um, to, to see what this does, we'll, we'll use a more interesting version of that, of that relationship graph uh, that has a, an extra person and a couple extra, extra relationships. So now there are, there are these relatives. Um, you can see Alice is the relative of Charlie, and uh, there's also a new person, David, and he's related to Charlie as well. Um, Okay, so, and also to, to, to save space on the slide here, I've stopped showing those, the vertex IDs. They're still there in the graph, but uh, just not, not on, this, on the slide. Uh, okay, so, um, so, so first let, let's give subgraph an edge predicate. What we'll do is we'll, we'll filter out those new relative relationships and try and go back to the old graph. So if, if we apply this, this filter, which um, this, this is just Scala, so we, we call subgraph and we, we, we give it an edge predicate, which is a closure that, um, that takes an edge and checks the attribute and makes sure it's not relative attribute. Okay, so if, if we do this, then we get something that's, that looks similar to the old graph in that it's this chain, but it also has, uh, it has David. So David is still around even though he's not involved in any relationships. Okay, uh, now, let, now let's try giving subgraph a, a vertex predicate. So this time we'll, uh, we'll filter out Bob from the graph. So this is a similar idea, except that we, we pass uh, the, the closure into the vertex predicate parameter instead. Um, so and we, and we check the name, make sure it's not Bob. And here's what that does. Okay, so this, uh, so, so, so now you can see the edges involving Bob. So the both uh, Bob is certainly gone, but also the edges involving him are also gone. Uh, and this, this, this points to something important, which is that GraphX always ensures that the graph you're dealing with is valid, uh, meaning that there are no dangling edges in it. All right, now the last operation that, that I'll talk about is MapReduce triplets. Uh, this enables GraphX to express those graph algorithms that we saw, earl saw earlier, and it takes, you can see, two user-defined functions. Um, the first one is this send message function, and this has the opportunity to send messages along edges. So it gets a triplet, uh, so not only can it look at the edge, but also it can look at the source and destination vertex property, and, uh, and, and it, can, it can return some one or more messages to the source and destination. Uh, and then the second uh, user-defined function is this aggregation function, so it's, a, it's a, the merge message function. 
And that combines messages that are destined to the same vertex. Uh, and then what this overall does is that it, it re returns an RDD that, uh, that contains a combined message for every vertex that received a message. So we can use this for all kinds of cool things, but I'll just use a simple example, uh, which is finding the degree of each vertex, which is the total number of edges that go in or out. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we have to call not produce triplets, and then for each edge, we'll send a one bo to both the source and destination vertex. So send a one to the source and the destination. Uh, and then we need to add up the ones that each vertex receives to find the degree. And, uh, and so we, we just use the Scala notation for adding two, two numbers. Okay, so if we run this on, this, on that, that bigger relationship graph that we have earlier, then uh, we can see that Alice is involved in two relationships, and, uh, and Charlie is in three, and David's only in one. Okay, now, um, uh, one last thing is that um, starting with Spark 1.2, we're starting to encourage users to, to call a different, almost identical version of this called aggregate messages. Um, and from the user point of view, this is just a cosmetic change. It's just a rename and like a small, small change. But actually, this, this lets us optimize things better because it avoids creating that iterator um, in the send method function. And so that turns out to be a pretty big performance win. All right, now um, I'd like to give you just a sense of how GraphX works underneath. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but you can come talk to me afterwards or during the exercises if you're interested. Okay, so first of all, um, GraphX stores graphs uh, pretty similarly to how we created them, um, which is that we, we put the vertices and their properties in an RDD, and we hash partition that by a vertex ID, and then we store the edges and their properties in a separate RDD, and that separation between the vertices and edges implies what's known in the graph literature as a vertex cut layout. So we're, rather than, than splitting the graph at, at the edge boundary, we're splitting it on vertices. And so there are the edges. Uh, okay, so now uh, that's great, but to, to implement many of the graph operations that I described earlier, we actually need to bring those RDDs together. Otherwise, it would be a trivial problem. So to, to get the, the triplets, for example, each edge needs the adjacent vertex properties. So for example, um, the edge AB needs both uh, the vertex property for A and for B. Um, so to, uh, to know which, which edge partitions that we should send each vertex property to, we're, we're going to do this using a third RDD, which GraphX calls the, the routing table. And this tells us that we should send, for example, A to both partitions, um, because it's referenced, it, it, it has edges adjacent on both, but uh, only send B to partition one, since there are no, uh, there's no uh, edges with B in, the, in partition two. So an important benefit of this is that uh, it gives us the freedom to choose the best edge partitioning strategy um, that, that minimizes communication. And in fact, uh, GraphX, by default, if you, if you give it a set of edges, it will just use the, the partitioning scheme of the RDD that you've, you've passed in. So there's no, there's no edge movement step um, in, involved in creating a graph, which is, which is important because the edges can be often much larger than the vertices. All right, so there, there are also a, other, a bunch of other interesting op optimizations that I won't go into detail about. Um, but again, you can talk to me about them afterwards. Uh, but the result of all, of all this, this work that we've put in, in, into the back end is that compared to writing an algorithm naively in Spark, GraphX is an order of magnitude faster. And it also, uh, at, at the bottom you can see there, there's two other um, specialized graph systems. And so GraphX is, is comparable in performance to, to these, these specialized systems that are actually, those are optimized just for running, the, for, just for running graph algorithms and, uh, and can't do things like joining in external data or integrating it with Spark in other ways. All right, finally, uh, I'll give you a preview of what's, uh, what's next for GraphX. So first of all, there, there's some language support uh, that's, that's coming soon. So the Java API is, is almost ready. Just, it pretty much just requires a review. There's a pull request that you can look at, in fact. Um, and, uh, and then there's a Python API on the, road, on the roadmap. Um, and there's a JIRA that tracks. Uh, we're actually collaborating with some uh, external companies who are interested in, in doing that. Okay, also, um, th th there's more algorithms coming. So uh, there's LDA, which is a topic modeling algorithm. Uh, this, is this is actually uh, going to go into, into MLlib, but in fact, in the back end, it's going to use GraphX, because as I, was, as I mentioned, you can see a lot of these, these problems as graph algorithms, and it can, be, it can make your algorithm faster to express them in that way. Oh, and, and uh, also there's this correlation clustering, which you'll hear about, I think, uh, I think later today. Um, and you know, your, your contributions, of course, are welcome for, for new algorithms as well. Finally, there, there's some speculative uh, things that we're looking at. So one of them is um, support for, for time-varying graphs. And um, so uh, 
the, the, the idea here is that graphs are in, in, real, in, in reality changing underneath, and um, we, want, we want some way to, to update that um, in Spark quickly. But uh, of course, the, there's sort of a problem, which is that, that Spark itself isn't really suited for, um, for updating data sets incrementally. And so th there's some research that involves uh, that, that's going on to do that. And then secondly, um, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at supporting graph database-like queries. So graph databases like, uh, like, um, uh, like Titan and Neo4j, uh, they, they support um, these subgraph pattern queries where, where, where you can express like, okay, I'm looking for you know, a triangle or I'm looking for um, a loop of, of four elements. And uh, uh, these databases are actually indexed in, in a way that makes those kinds of queries fast. Um, and so we're interested in maybe seeing how, how GraphX can, introduce, can incorporate both that kind of indexing while also retaining performance for the general uh, analytical style algorithms. So, so you mentioned why, algorithms. Ah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, LDA actually. Oh yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, so um, the question is, why, why is LDA going to going to use GraphX at all, rather than being in MLlib because it's a machine learning algorithm? Um, so the, the answer is that that LDA actually is going to be in MLlib. So from the user's point of view, you can call it just a, just like any other machine learning algorithm. But internally, it uses GraphX, and the reason for that is that um, it GraphX has some some optimizations that I mentioned, which which make it uh, pretty efficient to to work with uh, with graphs. In particular, it, use, it builds indexes and so on. Um, to, that avoid rehashing and ha has some internal tricks. And so the point is that if, if your algorithm um, can be expressed as a graph algorithm, then it often makes it faster to actually use GraphX. And this would be a decoupling unit or a two-way unit? Say, say that again? Uh, this would be a decoupling unit or a two-way decoupling unit? Oh, um, I think it's variational. I'm, I'm not sure, actually. But th th there's a pull request that you can, you can check out. So th that one I'm sure will tell you. Oh, sorry, the question was, is it Gibbs sampling or variational base? OK, so um, finally, um, you'll get a chance to try out GraphX later today. Uh, one of the later exercises is to work with some uh, cleaned up Wikipedia data. So I've already done the first few steps, the first three steps of this analytics pipeline for you, because the raw data is pretty big, too big to fit on the USB. But uh, you'll, you'll get to run PageRank on this subset of uh, subgraph of Wikipedia and find some interesting results about the articles that mentioned Berkeley. Okay, finally, um, GraphX is an, act, is an active project, and we always welcome contributions and collaboration. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, more questions. Yeah, so we, we do actually, I, I didn't include the backup slides this time, but we, we do have the numbers for that. And in fact, GraphX, we, we've measured that it scales, it's, so we, we compared against other competing graph systems, um, and GraphX scales slightly better than, um, Slightly better than, uh, than, uh, uh, than GraphLab, which is the competitor. Um, I don't know if this is well set on. I, th I think it's on. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Um, so uh, gra GraphX scales slightly better than, than GraphLab, as we measured. Um, but uh, so I mean, fundamentally, all these graph algorithms are quite communication bound, so they don't scale linearly, but reasonably. Yeah, I, I can show you the results afterwards if you're interested. Ah, uh, yeah. So there, there's a there's a discussion on the, on the mailing list, as I'm sure you're familiar. Oh, the, the question is um, uh, about the, the the status of a wrapper that involves blueprints for GraphX. So there, there are some other um, some other interfaces um, that people want to use to express graph queries, and the question is whether uh, how far that is out, I guess. So um, uh, so um, so the, the 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 answer to that is well, this is an effort that's that's mainly driven by the community. In fact, so we're you know at, at the Ant Lab letting other people take, take the lead on that. So the mailing list is actually the best place uh, you know, to, to find out. I wouldn't know. OK, one more question, if there's any. OK, thanks. OK, so I, I wanted to respond to the LDA question as well. I think Encore said it well, but I think that also highlights the fact that it's cool that GraphX and MLib and all these things are in the same place. So. In the future, we're also looking to re-implement ALS via GraphX, not because you can't implement it from barebone Spark, but because it should be you know, one-tenth the amount of code or some much, much less code, much easier to understand, and all the communication that we're trying to minimize 
in a bare bones implementation is already done for us with the GraphX primitives. So that's, you know, and I think the answer is similar with LDA. You could do it with bare bones Spark, but all the work's already been done for you by GraphX. You can actually understand it really easily because you just use these abstractions that they've introduced. So it's a win-win.